Today we start uh, the Church of Our Fathers. by Roland H. Fainton. And I've seen churches that look just like that. The Beginnings of the Church. We see Alpha Omega and a couple figures beside Jesus. The church is our spiritual home. Well, one's house of worship in general. In every village and town, the skyline is marked by the slender spire of the square tower of the church. In Europe and America, the church has been the greatest force in shaping the world in which we live. Well, it's not going to be too long. I think the corporation is the greatest force now. Um, but the spire, there are some churches that believe that the spire is unbiblical. Same thing with their synagogues that take that interpretation. Universities, schools, and colleges, hospitals, and asylums. Better prisons. Kinder laws. The ending of slavery and dueling and the attempt to end war and bring in the brotherhood of man. All these have been, in large measure, the work of the church. The church is something like a tree whose limbs, whose limbs branch off, some small, some large, some straight, some twisted, and those leaves in the fall may be still more, mostly green, with patches here and there of gold and flame. I think there's something in here that says it was a gift to my grandmother at some point. Um, even so, the church has many branches and leads, differing as to the form of the building, the dress of the clergy, the services and beliefs. Some spires are tipped with crosses and some with weather vanes. Some churches give the altar a central position in front and some the pulpit. In some, the minister wears robes of many colors, and others only a plain suit. The Quakers have no altars, and no pulpit, and no minister, yet all strive to serve one master. Seems rather unguided, but a general idea, which they all reach to, right? But is it the right master, or is it a demo urge? This book will try to tell briefly the story of the Christian church, how it came to be in the days of Jesus, and how many forms it has continued until now. The story will be told in part by the use of pictures taken from very early drawings. These drawings are as close to the events in which they describe as any that have been found. In some cases, nothing exists earlier than a hundred or more years after the events. There are, for example, no trustworthy likenesses of Jesus, Paul, or Peter. Errors in the pictures will be pointed out. Often very crude drawings have been chosen because they serve better than the great works of art to show the mind of the common Christian. If the originals were faint or torn, they have been retouched. And pictures from the Bible have sometimes proved useful because the men of each age imagined the Bible as people looking like themselves. On the next page are six pictures of David and Goliath, which show how soldiers dressed during the 16th centuries. The first is from a stone carving of Goliath as a Roman soldier. An arm has been broken off. Next, he appears as a soldier of Charlemagne then as a Saxon, then as a crusader in a coat of mail, close to the time of the discovery of America. He is shown in plate armor. The last picture was made after the invention of gunpowder, which made armor of little use. The stomach of the, this Goliath is quite unprotected. 
our story starts at, in the time of Jesus. Uh, historically, we have to say there's four times of Jesus, although there are some overlaps between those four historical characters. And this book is from 1941. This is a 1941 book. Does somebody go this again? Well, it's, the last picture was made after the invention of gunpowder, which made the armor of little use. The stomach of this Goliath is quite unprotected. Okay. Our story starts in the time of Jesus. He was born in Palestine 2,000 years ago. He was brought up in the Jewish religion described in our so-called Old Testament. His, further, uh, his, his father was a carpenter, and Jesus, as a boy, helped in the shop. So, not an immaculate birth. When he was 30, a religious teacher, like one of the old Jewish prophets, appeared in the wilderness telling men to turn from their sins because God was about to bring in a new age. This was John the Baptist. He was called the Baptist because he baptized. Jesus was baptized by him and then became a teacher in Galilee, the northern part in Palestine. The common people heard Jesus gladly because he, lighted, he lightened the burden of the religion by giving up the petty rules of the Pharisees, the students of the Jewish law, who would not allow the hungry, when passing through a field of corn, to do even the work of rubbing the husks in their hands. If the day were the Sabbath, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, and not the man for Sabbath. He made religion more simple and sensible, but not easier, for he taught men to forgive injuries and love even enemies. He cured of diseases. Great crowds followed him and listened with gladness, to his words. Some even wished to make him a king. Plahrose is the word that is used in the New Testament when he talks about not doing away with the letter of the law. He came to refurbish the law, not to do away with it. Um, not to fulfill it, and well, the law is complete, and it's not has to be done anymore. It's like when prophethood is complete, that doesn't mean that the whole message of prophethood is, you know. Jesus gathered about him a little band of followers and called them to be fishers of men, you know, because it was the age of uh, Pisces. They were the beginning of the Christian church. The Greek word for church, ecclesia, meant those who were called. And it, rather than church, it, actually there is words that we can use for church, but in the Christian and Gnostic Satanism study, I already shared what those were. Um, but ecclesia means a public gathering of members outside the family. So all this talk about women not speaking in church, it's taken to another level in this sort of thing. Because political as in a social gathering that's beyond the family. That's, that's all really politics is, um, and Ecclesia in particular, but you choose to be part of it. From this comes the Italian Chisa and French Eglise, the English word church, like the Scottish Kirk and the German Kirche. Kirche? Kirke, um, comes from another Greek word, kyriakon, meaning the Lord's house. Kyriakon, Kuri, yeah, it's not kyria, kyriakon, it's kyriakon, okay. One might have supposed how a person so good and kindly and great as Jesus would have had everybody on his side, but such was not the case. Well, that's an overstatement according to the Bible. He's overturning tables and uh, speaking insultingly to people. Um, the Pharisees disliked him from the start because he broke their rules. The common, well, he turned away from their authority was the actual reason. Not that he broke the rules, he kept the rules better than most of them. The common people turned away 
because he would not use his power to drive out the Roman conquerors who held Judea in rough bondage. The Jews believed that God would send a Messiah, which means an anointed one, to deliver them. They tended to believe that there was a constant string of messiahs as, uh, you know, as temple, as the temple rulers. But of course, most of the temple rites were not confined to the temple, actually, but they became confined to the temple. Might not Jesus be that Messiah? Could not he gather the people and drive out the Romans? Jesus was indeed a Messiah sent by God, you know, like Cyrus. And it says Cyrus is one of the Messiahs. There's a whole bunch of Messiahs in the Bible. But not to take the sword against the enemy. You know, because his people didn't want to follow him to that degree. He was to set up his kingdom in the hearts of men. When the common people found that he would not lead them into a war of rebellion, they turned against him. And, oh, that's interesting. SC, the South Carolina flag, could have came from a Roman thing. The rich came to fear him for a different reason. They did not mind if he changed the rules for the Sabbath, nor did they wish a war against the Romans, under whose role, under whose rule they were doing well. But Jesus angered them by attacking a practice that had grown up in the temple at Jerusalem. Here stood a great altar, that is, a stone on which animals were killed as an offering to God. The Jews who came to the temple from all parts of the world could not bring with them the oxen, lambs, and doves to sacrifice, but had to buy them on the spot. The money that they brought with them was not of the right kind and had to be changed in, into the coinage of Jerusalem. The sellers of the animals and the changers of the money made a big profit, which went into the purses of the rich. And But we see it's not just hieroglyph here, it's graven image that's on the, on the coins. Of course, usury is a sin too. The business was going on in the very temple itself. Jesus drove out the men and animals and overturned the tables of money. Three groups hated him then. The strict keepers of the law, well, the exaggerators of the law, the conservatives. Those of the common people wishing to rebel, the liberals and the reformists, and the rich. Whatever, actually, no, just still the, still the liberals and the reformists, right? Oh, well. Definitely among the Pharisees and stuff, the people were making money off of selling religion. They would have, because um, those those blue garments were like eight times their weight in gold uh, value. All watched for a chance to take him. Jesus, knowing that he could not long be hidden, had a last supper with his disciples and pointed to the bread and wine upon the table as signs of his body and blood, which would be broken and shed on the morrow. And this would have been grafted on the story from other things, but uh, the sacred meal thing could have been what led to uh, Christianity occurring, is that the despiritualization of life, people wanted the sacred meal. May this be my body, may this be my, uh, may this become our body, may this become our flesh, is something that I say and the more formal version of my evening rite, um, which I may start doing versions again again. All would desert him, he foretold, but Peter roundly stated that no matter what others might do, he would not fail. Before the cock crows, said Jesus, you will say three times that you do not know me. After supper, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus was taken by the Roman soldiers. The disciples fled. Peter followed at a distance. Okay, that's what the crop. The rooster and Peter then. A servant girl pointed him out as a follower of Jesus. He swore that he did not know him. 
Three times he swore. The cock crew. Peter went out and wept. Jesus was brought before the Roman governor, Pilate, and was accused of starting a revolt against Rome. That was exactly what he would not do. But Romans, but the Romans were afraid of any disturbance and did not look too closely at what it was all about. Jesus was condemned and put to death on a cross. In his pain, he prayed for his tormentors. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, you know, Father, in his figure of speech, of course. Jesus was laid in the tomb. The disciples had fled, never expecting again to see the master. So, Curie, um, master, meant that he was a spiritual leader. And father meant that he was in an inferior role. Not some part of divinity, but acting on behalf of divinity, right? Among the disciples, it was Peter to whom Jesus first appeared, risen from the dead. Others saw him also. Some did not, but they too believed, partially because they trusted the word of those who had seen, and partially because they could not that because they could see for themselves the risen Christ at work in the church, changing the lives of men. The earliest pictures by the Christians show their beliefs. Many of these pictures are found in the catacombs, underground passages only three feet wide. Winding in a maze beneath the surface of the outskirts of Rome, the catacombs were in the cemeteries of the Christians. The word catacomb means a place of sleeping underground, and the word cemetery also means a sleeping place because Christians believed that death is only a sleep. Most religions actually tend to believe that, I think. But there being an afterlife is pretty much universal. Along the walls of the catacombs were ledges for the remains of the dead, and upon the sp open spaces were carved names and words and pictures. In these pictures, Jesus was not shown rising from the grave. The resurrection was suggested by showing Jonah coming out of the whale. The Gospel of Matthew said that Jonah was three days and three nights inside the whale. So should Jesus be that long buried in the earth before he should rise from the dead and dying about sunset on Friday and being alive Monday, uh, Sunday morning, and somehow that fulfilling the prophecy is one of the greatest miracles that Christianity claims. Jesus himself was shown as the good shepherd, caring for the lamb. The face of the shepherd is not the one with the beard that came to be used for Jesus. We do not know what he looked like. Signs that stand for him are the first two letters of the name in Greek. R-C-H is one letter in Greek, you know, and it's shaped like our X. And the Greek R has the shape of our P. These two letters were combined in a monogram, which actually Jupiter and, and such, you know, arrangement that was actually seen in the sky under Constantine in Constantine's time, and that's partially where the logo comes from. Although it did exist before that, so it could be that combination of Jupiter and such in the sky. Um, also, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet called Alpha and Omega stand for Jesus because they consider him to be the first and the last. The dove stands for the spirit of God and also for peace. The fish was a common sign of Christianity because Jesus had fed the multitudes with loaves and fishes because he told the disciples to be fishers of men and because the letters of the word for fish in Greek contained the first letters of the Greek word meaning the Greek words meaning Jesus, son of God, savior. And that's again another form that had been repeated and taken on by the Christians. Um, Ehosus, remember my 888 video? Um, I pointed out how it's an egregor formula. It has 
meaning that doesn't really come out as a proper name for an individual. Peter made bold by the forgiveness of the risen master, gathered the disciples and began preaching to the people that Jesus, who had been crucified, still lived. Let them be sorry for their wrongdoings and turn and follow him. The Jewish leaders told Peter to stop. He answered, Decide for yourself whether it is right for me to obey you or God. Among these leaders of the Jews, who were hot against the Christians, was the one who later became the Apostle Paul. And Paul, in the physical sense, did not know Jesus in any way. He got permission from the priest at Jerusalem to go to Damascus and hunt out the Christians. Historically, Paul was not did not encounter Christianity until he became a Christian. And we'll see part of how that could have risen, if that's the case. On the way, he was struck as if by light from heaven and answered the call of Christ to become a Christian. You know, he fell down and went blind for a few days and heard a voice. And I'm the one you're persecuting. Not Most people would say it's someone who he's chasing, right? Now, Paul said it was God himself. And... Presuming his enemy be gone, so when he went to learn later, then he also put that presumption upon what he learned. So you know that's that's Paul and that's uh, that's Jonah and the and the whale. And here's an early picture of him. In latter times, he was commonly shown with a sword and a book. Paul had been angry with the Christians because they would not keep the Jewish law. When he became Christian, he decided that the laws on food, fast, and ceremonies were not binding. Not initially, though. And he went back and forth and he worked out what he would consider the law to be. Jewish Christians might keep them if they chose, but should not require them of Gentile Christians. Gentile meaning goyim, those who turn their back on God. So, uh, the context kind of implies that they're wrong, doesn't it? But they, you know, they switch the word Gentile as being non-Christian later. Other disciples should not require them. Uh, oh, other disciples disagreed because although Jesus broke the law of the Sabbath. Actually, it says he kept him, but not in the uh, conservative way. He did keep the Jewish holy days. Paul answered, this was a case of may and not of must for Jesus' followers. So you don't have to follow Jesus. You worship Jesus, that's good enough for Paul. Actually, it's not quite. Well, you know, if you go into more detail, you'll find out that that's not quite the case. Galatians Five can be pretty strict for some people. In the debate over this question, Paul won. He became the great preacher to the Gentiles in the Greek cities and in Rome. Paul preached Christ crucified and risen from the dead. The Jews, of course, opposed him because this was not their belief. The Gentiles also opposed him because they worshipped idols or images of their gods or nothing at all, obviously, um, which Paul said, were no gods and should be broken. The men who made their living by carving idols naturally did not like such teachings. At Ephesus, they staged a riot. The Roman governors could not overlook disturbances of this sort. They did not care what caused them. The Romans were not interested in disputes about Jewish law, and not especially in the idols of the Greeks. But riots must be stopped. And if there's breaking and stealing and stuff, uh, that's a serious criminal offense. As Paul seemed to be the cause of the riots, he was frequently imprisoned and beaten. After a long imprisonment at Rome, he was put to death. The Romans at first did not understand that Christianity was a different religion from that of the Jews. Judaism was never one religion, and there were monotheisms and polytheisms among them. Jesus had been a Jew. Paul was a Jew. The religion, then, must be a form of Judaism. If you define Judaism in a modern, secular way, you have to definitely say that. It's a ethnic appearance among, 
what were considered the Jewish people, uh, and an ethnic Jewish people of that, and a and a Jewish people by hereditary, not um, at some point in Europe or Asia or Africa or something, somebody decides to be Jewish. I mean, actually Semitic people. But as the time went on, the Romans were to find that Christianity was a new religion, a religion that grew stronger every day, a religion that would overturn many beliefs and practices of the Roman Empire, a religion that could not be overlooked. And if you turn to Tonic, you'll find many reasons why uh, Christianity was never expected, but certainly people believing as they would want to believe is something that should be allowed. And there's a difference between a lot of countries, people claim that Christians are being persecuted. As long as they're not inciting riots or anything like that, or using religious coercion, dangling food in front of poor people saying, oh, you have to practice Christianity and we'll feed you right, and we'll, and we'll, and you must speak a foreign language and various things. Um, but actual religious freedom, a lot of countries, Christians are allowed to do things that the majority of the people aren't allowed to do. And still people are claiming persecution. So whatever the faith of your ancestors, that is their faith. You're not bound to automatically follow that.